نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising Allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whoever Allah guides no one can misguide but whoever Allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and I testify that there is no God that there is nothing that is worthy of being worshipped except Allah and I testify that Muhammad may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him he is Abdullah which means he is the servant and the worshipper of Allah and he is Rasulullah he is the messenger of Allah first of all I would like to apologize that I don't speak Norwegian so I'm going to be talking to you in English uh, I know most of you, many of you, alhamdulillah, understand English. So it's uh, maybe a blessing for me anyway, that many people in the world speak the language, the only language that I actually know very well. So, alhamdulillah. Um, hopefully I will speak clearly and inshallah, I hope my brothers uh, and sisters in Islam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower His mercy and His forgiveness and His blessings upon you on this beautiful day of Jum'ah. Ameen. I really want to talk about a subject that is important to me personally. But it is also a subject that is a very important aspect of our religion and this is the subject of da'wah this is the subject of calling those people who are not yet Muslim calling them to Islam of course the word da'wah in Arabic has a broad meaning from the linguistic point of view da'wah means to invite to call actually it is connected and from the same word as dua means to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you make dua you are calling upon Allah when you make da'wah you are calling someone to Islam. Actually, of course, it is the same. Although in Urdu, when you say Dawat, you mean to invite someone for dinner. But actually, Dawat in Islam is inviting someone to dinner as well. But this dinner you are inviting them to is the Deen of Islam, the most beautiful feast. It is food for the soul it is food for the soul food for our nafs food for our ruh this is, and this is an example that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself he gave this example he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam my example is that of a man who invited people to a feast my example, he said, is that of a man who invited people to a feast. 
So the people who accepted this invitation, they ate from the feast. The ones who refused, they did not. They did not eat. Also, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you and have mercy upon you. This also implies that once you have accepted the invitation, you've accepted the invitation, and you are eating from the feast, we are not really thinking now of dawah. Once you are a Muslim, in some ways we don't give dawah to Muslims. Muslims need tarbiyah. Muslims need islah. Muslims need tazkiyah. So once you are in the feast, we'll be saying, brother, please, you know, you should eat from the outside of the plate and eat what is near to you and eat with your right hand not with your left hand you see we are perfecting the good manners teaching them good manners improving their characteristics so the job of dawah is to bring the people to the feast to bring the people to islam of course however my dear brothers and sisters we can't make people muslim we can't. It is not even our job to make people Muslim. In fact, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ would have loved to make everyone Muslim. In fact, he, he ﷺ was so concerned and so worried. And he wanted the people to become Muslim so much. That this was nearly killing him. He was nearly dying. Subhanallah, he was nearly killing himself. From this, can you imagine? You heard of people dying from grief. You heard of people, their heart is broken and they die from love. Have you heard stories like this? They're true stories. People die of grief. People die of worry many people die of worry how many people have heart attacks they have high blood pressure and this is worry this is the worry about dunya of course dunya dunya worry worry my bill this my that my business this my worry 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 and it kills them you die of a thought subhanallah and this was the condition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was so worried, he was so concerned that the people were not becoming Muslim. And even some of those people were the ones he loved the most. Like his uncle, Abu Talib. By the way, this is a very important proof and evidence that you can love a kafir. You can love a kafir. You can. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet in the Quran, you can't guide the ones that you love. Meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved a person who was not guided. And that was his uncle Abu Talib. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him, but he was not a Muslim. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted him to become Muslim so much. This is very important. And I advise those brothers who speak very strongly and talk about the kuffar, this and hate and everything is full of hate. It's not necessarily so. This is, a, this is not... The complete picture you are looking at is to how you relate to the people who are not Muslim. So this is the concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Allah had to tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you don't guide the ones you want. Allah guides the ones He wants to guide. He knows who is guided. And He will guide the people. He will guide them. 
He will choose the ones. And Allah knows the time, the right time to guide those people. So then what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi what was he doing then? Did the Prophet say, oh, that's good, let me sit down and relax and, you know, have some dates and some water and I'll just say my prayers and uh, I will fast and make dhikr and read Quran and just teach the Muslims. No. Did, is that what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did? He didn't. He still went out and he called the people. He used to go down to the Kaaba. The Kaaba, my brothers, I want to remind you. In that time, people used to make tawaf round the Kaaba naked. Naked. They worshipped 360 idols. Yet the Prophet wasallam used to go down there. He used to pray there. He used to go to give da'wah and to invite the people down there. He didn't let all of these things distract him from his duty of calling the people to Islam. He would go to the marketplaces where the people are buying and selling the trade fairs of the time. And he would go there and he will call the people to Islam. And he would do whatever he could to invite them. In fact, the first time, I, and he was not, he did not make the message ambiguous. Meaning he didn't make it confusing what Islam was about. He didn't make it confusing what his message was. The very first time he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called the people publicly to Islam. He stood on the top of Mount Safa. And he called the people of Mecca. He called the tribes by name. One after the other. Until they sent their leaders. Either the leaders came themselves or they sent a representative. And then when they were there, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh my people, if I was to tell you that there is an army about to attack us from behind the hill, would you believe me? So what did they say? They said, Muhammad, we never heard anything except truth from you. Subhanallah. Allah, He made them testify. We never heard you lie. We never heard you speak an untruth. All we heard from you, Muhammad, is truth. Of course we will believe you. If that's what you say, we will believe you. According to one narration, the Prophet then said, I warn you of the fire, I warn you of the fire, I warn you of the fire. I warn you of Annar. I warn you of Annar. This is what he said. According to one narration. According to another narration, he said, I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. And then on top of that, he did something extraordinary for the Arabs of the time. He told them that their tribal allegiances and their tribal connections would not benefit them at all. He said that I cannot help you in front of Allah. He said even Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, I cannot help you in front of Allah unless you are righteous. Unless you lead a good life. Unless you worship Allah and accept Islam. This, and this, my brothers and sisters, went against everything the Arabs held to be true. Because they, like many of us today, despite Islam coming to us, despite us being brought up as Muslims with the Quran in our house, the Arabs of the time, they were tribal people. They had tribalism, a type of nationalism. They thought that if you belong to my tribe, you will support me. You are from my tribe. We're from the same tribe. We will help each other no matter what. I don't care whether you did something right or wrong. You're from my family. I will help you. 
But the Prophet wasallam made it clear that this was not the case. That belonging to his tribe was not going to help. Even his own daughter, subhanallah, it was not going to help. And another time, and another, uh, and uh, you maybe remember the incident. And this is the justice in Islam, my brothers. This is the justice in Islam. This is our religion. This is what we have forgotten. This is why we have lost our izzat, our honor as a nation. Because we've forgotten these principles of justice. There was a time when a woman from a very rich part of the Quraysh, she was from a powerful rich family, she stole something and she was caught. And of course they had to implement the punishment, the hudud. You know the hadood for the chopping, for the, the stealing. So they thought, well, she's from this important family. How can we do this? You know, someone needs to go and intercede with the Prophet ﷺ to stop this happening. They were thinking, who can we send? Well, they sent Osama. Because he was very close and the Prophet loved him. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard what Osama was saying, he was, he said, "Are you trying to intercede with me for, on one of the hadood of Allah?" He said, "Wallahi, by Him in whose hand is my soul, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, stole, we would implement Allah's punishment on her." How many Muslims have this attitude today? How many of you treat your own children like that? Your own cousins and uncles and relatives? How many of you have this viewpoint of justice? That I will do what is right. I will do what Islam says and I don't care. What my cousins and my uncles, what my mother and my father, what my children and my wife say, I will do the right thing that Islam says. My brothers, until you and sisters think like that and behave like that, we will always be humiliated. And this is, by the way, my brothers, this is the big, one of the big differences between us, the Muslims, and the non-Muslims. I'm not saying they're perfect. Of course, they're not perfect. A'udhu Billah. Only Allah is perfect. But by and large, brothers, by and large, sisters, it's not always the case. But even if the son or the daughter of your prime minister commits a crime, they will still have to go to court. They will still have to face the penalty. They will still have to face the consequences. This is how we used to be. Ali, when he was the, when he was the Amir al-Mu'mineen, he was summoned by the judge. He was summoned by the judge and he was the Amir of the believers. And the judge summoned him to court and he had to subject himself to the rule of the court. This is the justice in Islam. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he stood up and called the people publicly, he told them this. How controversial is that? How radical is that? In that society, hugely controversial, hugely radical. But the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't hiding anything. He needed to make this clear what this message was about. And the Prophet ﷺ, my brothers and my sisters, he kept on calling, even though Allah told him, you can't guide the people. Allah guides the people. But he kept on calling the people because why? That was his duty. He knew that was his obligation. That Allah ordered him with that task of calling the people. Giving them Bashiran, good news, and Nadiran. Giving them the warnings. He's the bringer of glad tidings and he's warning of the terrible punishment and the consequences of refusing to accept 
belief in Allah. And that's what he did. He kept on calling. Do you know, my brothers and sisters, do you know, in the whole of the life of Rasulullah, so let me, let, let's take some snapshots of how the Prophet وسلم, suffered. How he suffered. You think you have problems in your life? Subhanallah. There are people, many, you know there are Muslims. Maybe we're including us. They say, we love Rasulullah. How much we love Rasulullah. They sing songs for him. They celebrate his birthday. And they say, we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Really? What does it mean to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I think, maybe I'm wrong. But I think if you really love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will do the things the Prophet did. You will care about the things Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cared about. And let's see, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam care about? The most. And let's think about his life. Think about those early days when there were only a handful of people who listened to his message. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, the only person who didn't even think about it. When the Prophet said, I've come with a message from Allah, he said, If you say you've come with a message from Allah, you've come with a message from Allah. Abu Bakr, that was it. Why they call him as Siddiq. He didn't hesitate. The Prophet said he's the only one. And I think except Khadija, of course, Khadija, who's the first Muslim, was a woman. Ali was very young when he became Muslim. And they used to make fun of Ali. So the early Muslims, they were very few. Can you imagine? And how the Prophet ﷺ was mocked. How he was made fun of. How when he stood on top of Mount Safa, Abu Lahab, he said, is this, is this what you bothered us for, Muhammad? May your face be, be rubbed in the dust. This is what Abu Lahab, his uncle, said to Rasulullah May your face be rubbed in the dust. This is the way the Arabs say, may you be humiliated. You bothered us to tell us this nonsense? Can you imagine how hard that is? Even though everyone just said, yes, you're truthful, we believe you. <laughs> Subhanallah, there's one time when the Prophet went down to the Kaaba and he was praying and they poured the entrails of a camel on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And Fatima, his daughter, was pulling, the, pulling that mess off, shouting at the Quraysh. There was a time when he was beaten so badly by the Quraysh and by the mob. He nearly died from that. And that's what caused his uncle, Hamza, to embrace Islam. He was so angry. They said, Hamza is the only one who became Muslim from being angry. <laughs> so he went through all of this. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? Can you imagine the boycott when they took the Muslims and all of Bani Hashim? Not just the Muslims, but Bani Hashim as well. Subhanallah. So some kuffar suffered <laughs> because they protected those Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ. They put them all in a valley. The Prophet said we were eating leaves from the trees for two years, brothers. For two years, sisters. Eating leaves from the trees. And then Khadija. The one who gave him so much emotional support. The one whom Allah sent salam through Jibreel. She died. His uncle, Abu Talib, who protected him, died. That's hard. Well, let's think about the battle of Uhud. Can you imagine that day when the tooth of the Prophet was broken? When the Muslims were, subhanAllah, what, how they suffered in that battle. 
How about when his son Ibrahim died in his arms, six months old, his son Ibrahim died. Can you imagine your child dying in your arms? But you know which day out of all of these days and many other days of suffering and hardship and difficulty, which day did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Aisha asked him, what was your hardest day? What did he say the hardest day? Who knows? Which day was the hardest day? Huh? Where was it? What was that day? Does no one know? Huh? Taif. The day when Allah gave permission. Can you imagine? I can imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He spent all of this time. The Muslims have made hijrah to Abyssinia because life is so tough. They're being tortured. They're being killed like Sumaya bin Jash. Tortured and killed. They've gone to Abyssinia. His tribe has boycotted it. But then Allah gives permission to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to leave Mecca and to go to Taif. I am imagining the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is full of hope and expectation. He's thinking maybe that the reason Allah has given him permission is because the people of Taif are going to accept Islam. They're going to accept his message. Maybe that's what he's thinking. I'm just guessing. I don't know. So I'm, I'm guessing he must be going there full of expectation and hope. And then when he gets there, my brothers, when he gets there, my sisters, and he talks to the leaders, they start to make fun of him. They start to mock him. They, some of them refuse to meet him. And they don't leave it at that. When they refuse to accept his message and refuse to act as protectors for that message, they didn't just leave it there. No. They got the street urchins, the children, the waifs, the rubbish. Instructed them to stone and throw stones at the Prophet as he's leaving. This is the Arabs. Is that how you treat your guest? <laughs> Subhanallah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's leaving Taif. The stones are being thrown. His body is bleeding. The blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is there one of you, if you have true iman and you say you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you have true iman, you would prefer that you are standing there and you are being stoned and you would love that for yourself. You wish, if you love Rasulullah, that you could take those blows. If you don't, your Iman is deficient. Your Iman is, you do not truly, your claim to love Rasulullah is an empty claim. That's the Sahaba, they love the Prophet that much. That's why they would shield themselves when the arrows are coming. They would stand in the way of the Prophet to take the arrows. That's love. So the, the messenger of Allah, he's bleeding. The blood is flowing down. His sandals are sticking to his feet because the blood is drying. He gets to the bottom of the valley and he sits down in a garden, exhausted, dejected. All his hopes, his aspirations, it's dashed. He was, came with all of these hopes. And this is, he called this my hardest day out of all of his life. This was the hardest. This was the most difficult to take. Yet how does Rasulullah act? How does he behave? What does he say? When Jibreel comes to him, alayhi salam. And when Jibreel says, Muhammad, just give us the order. Tell me. And Allah has given me permission that the angels of the mountains, because Taif is in the mountains, the angels will crush that town. Crush it! The Prophet ﷺ says, No, don't do that. Because maybe from their children, there will be people who will become Muslim. And brothers, you want to know about vision? 
You want to know about purpose? You want to know what was important to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do you want to know what he cared about so much? Dawah. That the people would become Muslim. That the people would become guided to Islam. Now let me ask you my brothers. You claim, you people, you claim you love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You claim that you follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me ask you a question. If you walk out of your door and you knock on the doors of your neighbors and you invite them to Islam, is anyone going to stone you? You know what? In this kafir land that we talk about, some people kafir land, if they stone you, you can call the police and the police will arrest those people. And what are you doing? Who has done it? I wonder. Hands up in this room who has done that, bothered to tell their non-Muslim neighbors about Islam. And you say you love the Prophet So One hand, subhanAllah. You say you love the Prophet You think you care about what the Prophet wasallam cared about? Brothers, I challenge you. From the Quran, Anyone who's a hafiz of the Qur'an, bring me the Qur'an and show me anywhere in the Qur'an where you can describe to me the Salah of Nuh, the Tahajjud of Nuh, the Dhikr of Nuh, the Fasting of Nuh, the Sadaqah of Nuh. Was Nuh a pious man or not? Yes or no? Nuh alayhi salam, a prophet of Allah. Is he not the best of the human beings after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Are not the messengers the best of the human beings? Yes or no? Are they not an example for us to follow? Yes or no? So why do you think Allah told us in the Quran the stories of the prophets? For what reason? For bedtime stories for our children? Is that why? Or is it an example for us to follow? Yes, an example for us to follow. Brothers, sisters, you will not find in the Quran anything about Nuh's dhikr or salah or psalm or sadaqah or zuhud. Everything we know about Nuh in the Quran is what? What? What is it? Dawah. Why? How about Ibrahim? Musa? Isa? Suhaib? Think about the prophets. Their stories are stories of dawah, brothers. Don't you understand how important dawah is in Islam? Don't you know the virtue of dawah with Allah? And let me ask you another question, my brothers. Let me ask you another question. Is there going to be another messenger after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yes or no? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, I'm not in a Qadiani masjid or temple. So he's Khatam al Nabiin. Yes? He's the seal of the Prophets. If he's the seal of the Prophets and there are no more messengers coming after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have a question for you. Whose responsibility is it to continue the task of the messengers to call people to Islam? Hours. Waltukum minkum ummatun, yaduana il al khairi, waya maruna bil ma'arufi, wayan hauna in al munkari, wa ula ikahumul muflihun. Let there arise from you a group of people, a band of people, yaduana il al khairi, inviting and calling, making dawah to all that is good, and that is the comprehensive good of Islam. Ya marufa bin. They are inviting to what is good. And they are forbidding what is evil. And they are the muflihun brothers. They are the successful ones. Qul. Allah said in the Quran. Qul. Say Muhammad. Qul hadihi sabili uddu ila Allah. Ala basira. Ana wa man atabaani. Say O Muhammad. This is my sabil. This is my way. Uddu ila Allah. I invite. To Allah, to La ilaha illallah, ala basira, with certain knowledge. Ana, me, wa man atabaani, and those who follow me. If you follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will be making dawah to Allah, to La ilaha illallah, with basira, with certain knowledge. If you are a follower of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers, let us not be deluded. 
Let us not fool ourselves. Allah will ask us. He will ask us on the day of judgment. I want to finish with a story. I have only a few minutes. I have so much more I could say. I'm going to finish with a story. It's not a hadith. It's not an ayah. It's a story. In fact, it's a story we made it up. But it's very profound. There was this king. A powerful, mighty king. And the king received news that there was a certain land. A certain land that had agreed to become part of his kingdom. So the king chose his trusted servant, Abdullah. The king said, Abdullah, go to the land and tell the people, I am their king. They should follow my laws and they should pay my taxes. So Abdullah, he travels and he goes to the land. And years pass. 10 years, 15 years. And the king has heard nothing from Abdullah. So the king, he sends Ahmed, another trusted servant. He says, Ahmed, Go and find out what happened to Abdullah. I'm worried about my servant. So Ahmed travels and he goes to the land. And he starts to ask the people, Where is Abdullah? They say, Abdullah, we don't know any Abdullah. So he begins to describe Abdullah. Look, Abdullah, he's like this. He's tall, he has a beard. You know, he's like this, he's such and such. Oh, they say, yes. We know someone by that name. But it's not Abdullah, he's Abs. And he lives on the outskirts of the... Yes, he's a very nice man. He's got very good manners. He's very, we like him. He's a nice man. Ahmed is thinking, what's going on? So he travels. And sure enough, when he gets to this place, he finds Abdullah living in a comfortable house with a family, children, little business. He says, Abdullah, what happened to you? He says, Ahmed, first of all, I love the king. I have never made any partners with the king. I have never set up another king besides the king. He is my king. I love him. I'm loyal to him. But I thought I will come here and, you know, first I will make relax and settle myself down and start a business. And, you know, and, and just let the people get to know me. And, you know, maybe after a bit of time they would realize the king, he's not that bad. He's, he's a nice king, really. You know, and we get, you know, I, I, you know I'm just being friendly with them. You know, uh, I, I'll get around to telling them. Really, my brothers, how is Abdullah feeling? What is he thinking? Ahmed is there to remind him. Abdullah, the king told you, go to that land and say, I am the king. You should follow my laws and pay my taxes. Did Abdullah do his job, my brothers? Did Abdullah fulfill his duty to the king? I think I know, you know the example I am illustrating to you. We, most of us, are Abdullah. We are Abdullah. Allah has given us a task to communicate this message. Brothers, please come to the Peace Conference. Here's some more inspiring lectures to motivate you and guide you, inshallah, to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His deen, be part of this experience to invite people to Islam. Make an effort in your life to talk to those people that you know, your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors. Let them know about Islam. It's not your job to guide them. Alhamdulillah, Allah didn't say make them Muslim. But Allah did say pass the message in the best way. If you don't know how, let us teach you how. Come to our Dawah training course or one of our Dawah training courses. We will teach you how to give Dawah. I know most of you want to do it, but maybe it's just that you don't know how. So learn like anything else. May Allah bless you, my brothers. May Allah bless you, my sisters. May Allah guide all of us. All of us. I need this advice for myself as well. Believe me, it's just as much a reminder to me as it is to you. So may Allah guide us to fulfill our duty and obligation of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us from the successful ones in this dunya and in the akhirah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayya. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa jazakallah khair.